I think we're ready to begin. How's it going, judges and everybody else out there? My name is Ty Blunt. I'm from Fountain Hills, Arizona. My product's the NAC. It stands for Nail Anywhere Kit. So from a small age, I was that kid that used to invent stuff, develop stuff, and I used to buy and sell vintage cars and refurbish them. So I've always been a leader. I was leader of the captain of the football team and captain of the soccer team in high school. And I'm a complete shark, judges. I will do anything to win this $4,000 and to go on and become a millionaire as fast as and soon as I can. So the problem with normal nail kits, first off, items come lost regularly in your purse, your bag, your pocket, your cupboard, anything comes lost regularly. Second off, as my assistant will show you, a normal nail kit is just completely bulky. It does not fit in a normal bag anywhere. It's impossible to pull out. And um, other things, uh, anything pointy in these bags, briefcases or anything, uh, luggage, that can destroy the inner lining of the bag. So you women out there that or guys that have Gucci briefcases or wallets or anything like that, it can destroy the inner lining of bags and it costs you thousands of dollars. Also, if you buy quality pieces of nail tools, it can also cost you a total of $100 if you buy them separately. So uh, here's my first prototype. It's a... Uh, uh, it, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty crude, but it gets the point across to the judges and to the, um, the classmates. And it has everything you need for a nail kit. So I did this in my dorm room. I, um, I live in Tropicana Gardens, and uh, I use some of the tools that my assistant will show you in Tropicana Gardens. Um, so if you ever heard the smoke alarm go off, it probably was me. So I'm sorry for that ahead of time. So um, I use this. It's very uh, not safe, but I did it anyway to show my classmates how uh, dedicated I am to working. So my motto is unique but simple. As um, my product states, so if you open it up, it's sort of like a female Leatherman. So it has everything a woman needs. So it can even fit in this such small bag. It has everything a woman needs. So it has a uh, file, scissors, cuticle pusher, and cuticle nippers right here. Also has a click in and click out easy access tweezers for quick on the go use. Also has a slide in and slide out action locking in place mechanism so it doesn't flop around your bag and destroy the inner lining handbag. So competition. There is no real competition in the neck. It is one of a kind. But Revlon and Tweezerman are the main competition I have just because they have quality pieces, but they aren't packaged all together like the knack is. Right here is Tweezerman's uh, knack, but really it isn't a knack. It only has three tools, mine has six. Um, my market analysis, so um, I was gonna go for retail at first, but as such a small company, it's impossible to uh, uh, get the retail into stores, such a small company, so I went to the corporate gift giving. So that is just, um, I sell uh, my gift to the corporation, and some of the normal gifts are meat such as this, packaged costs upwards of $100, which is uh, incredible, incredible for um, what cost for, you can buy that at the store. Pens. These pens cost $200, and these give these as gifts. My knack, perfect for the everyday use, and also it's under $25, so it can be written off as a tax write-off, which is great. So it's pretty much free. Keep giving the product. Um, I have purchase order already. Um, I've always been told if your product is viable, it can sell. I've already sold mine to a company already, right here, Colonial General Insurance Agency. Uh, it's in Arizona. It's a big company. They bought 500 of them for $10,800, and uh, I profit $7,500 from this, so it's a uh, big time. It gets me out in front of all my competition. So here's my slides. I need to build 500 units for the purchase order. Uh, cost me $5 made in China. Um, number of units sold is 500. It cost them $20 to buy it from me. The first month, I'll be negative $5,600. In the fourth month, the second week in the fourth month, I'll break even. And my total revenue this year will be uh, $58,000. So investment. I have stuck my own $10,000 in this. It's not for my parents, not for my uncle, not for anybody else, my own $10,000. I did this mainly because, first off, it shows investors that I am dedicated to this. I will do anything and put as much time and effort as I can into my product. Um, I'm looking for 25% uh, of my company for uh, $75,000. I want to license my product off to either uh, Revlon or Tweezman because first off, they have great market share and where I cannot get into, they can get into. 
So uh, they have shelf space and they know everything about retail of nail care products and such. So um, judges, first off, you should vote for me to win this competition first off because I have a 500 uh, unit purchase order, which is I make $7,500 uh, $7, off the purchase order. Uh, I have a manufacturer in China, as you see here. They're ready for me to um, complete my, uh, once I get this $4,000, I'll be able to manufacture my purchase order and get on the market. I have a niche in the market. Like I said, Revlon and Tweezer Man and all those companies do not have exactly what I have. This is one of a kind thing and um, no one can, pat uh, it's patentable, so no one can take it from me. I have extremely high margins. My margins are 400% and 500 if I go to retail. It's a patent pending device. so. It also has uh, qualities to go into utility patents and to design patents as well. So that's another step I have to protect myself. And again, there is no real competition with the NAC. I'll say this over and over. It's unique and simple. It keeps everything that a woman needs or a man needs for everyday use on the go cool, uh, tools. <laughs> Judges, my product is so viable, I have all these things that I feel a reason why I have been put first here is to show you guys that I'm so viable that no one can uh, stand up to me. Thank you. Questions? Judges? Thank you, Nack. Um, thank you for showing us Nack, Ty. Um, just one question here. Is this going to be your sole market? Is the um, gift, corporate gift field? Oh, no. I'm just doing this as we speak so that retail, uh, retail is very hard to get into as of right now. So uh, right now I'm going to the corporate market until I can build my revenue up and be able to get in the vast market easier and to show that Revlon and Tweezer Man that I can um, compete with them. So what are your plans for addressing the corporate market? What's the distribution plan? Um, right now, I have uh, 10 uh, companies already signed up, cause just from word of mouth. And I'm going to go on uh, social networks, eBay, all those things to sell retail at first. But just as a word of mouth, the company I sold mine to, they loved it that much. They told another company, which told another company. And I have, when I get out of here, I'm going back to Arizona, and I have 10 companies lined up to see my product already. <clears throat> so if you were to win the $4,000, how much of that would go directly into the production of your purchase order? Uh, all of it. All of it would uh, go into production and then um, uh, actually around $3,500 would go into production. And the other five hundred would go to um, getting an investor. In Arizona there is a competition, not a competition, but a trade show or less, to get investors into your, um, it's $500 entry fee, so that's what it would be for. Okay. Is that it? Thank you. So. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Rowland and I'm excited to tell you about my business, The Vintage Parlor. This is actually a splash page from the current website that I do have. It's an actual business that's running right now and it has already broken even. The thing is, today, when people go to shop for home decor, say they go to a Target or a Walmart, they'll find that it's mass produced. Uh, it looks just like everything else. Your mom has it, your friends have it. It doesn't express your unique individuality. Um, in addition to that, if you decide that you want to find something unique and you want to start buying vintage and antiques, it can be very time consuming for, to go from brick and mortar to brick and mortar store. It's hard to find what you're looking for and when you do find what you're finally looking for, there's a good chance that it's been grossly overpriced. Um, in addition to that, if you live in another country, there's almost no availability for vintage and antiques. So what I'm finding is that there's a huge market and a huge need for vintage antiques in today's marketplace and consumers are turning to the internet to find these products. Um, that's where my business comes in. The Vintage Parlor is an online retail store which specializes in unique vintage home decor as well as uh, vintage inspired handmade goods such as perfume and jewelry. Uh, the products are sourced locally here in Santa Barbara from secondhand stores, thrift stores, garage sales, estate sales. They're refurbished, then they're professionally photographed and merchandised by myself, and then they're put up for sale online via the site Etsy.com. If you're not familiar with the site Etsy, it's kind of like eBay but way cooler and it caters to a more um, niche customer, it's more aesthetically pleasing and it's not an auction style. Um, 
The features about my business, what sets it apart, is that it's a carefully cur curated collection. It's not just a menagerie of random items which you'll often find in vintage home stores. Um, the products are all cohesive. They look well together. They're visually presented in a way that's never been done before. The products are also sustainable. I promote the buying and selling of recycled goods, which is a huge, huge market. My items are one of a kind. You're probably not going to find them anywhere else. And also, they're affordable, which is hard to find today. Vintage and antiques tend to be very pricey. My price point is $25 to $45 per item. Additionally, they all come with customary, complimentary custom gift wrapping and a handwritten thank you note written by myself. And best of all, they can be shipped anywhere in the world. Here's an example of some of the products that I sell and the way that I merchandise it and phot photograph it. This is an exam example of the packaging. Um, some of the perfume and the way the jewelry comes packaged. My target market is primarily females, aging in range from 20 to 35, and their income is 15 to $50,000. Um, Etsy has 22 million uh, site members as of today. They have 42 million site views, uh, new visitors per month, and 1.5 million site views per month. Um, Etsy sales at 2009 were 176 million and they jumped all the way to 895 million in 2012. Huge, huge growing company. Online shopping is expected to increase to 269 billion by 2015. My particular store has already had 325,000 shop views since 2010. I've had over 1,000 sales in the vintage category and almost 500 sales in the jewelry and perfume category. And I have 9,000 Etsy followers. Revenue model is pretty simple. I buy or make the products and I sell them directly to the customer. They can pay via credit card or PayPal and I pay about 6% in commissions and processing fees. I promote my shop on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I offer discounts for repeat customers. This is often included like a 10% coupon code with every order. Uh, I offer seasonal sales and discounts. This includes things like Cyber Monday, Black Friday, which are huge, huge profitable online shopping days. I also use advertising on like home decor, blogs and design sites. I often offer them free product and trade for publicity. And I've also been very fortunate to, be, to have already been selected by Etsy's merchandising department as a featured seller. This means they've written an entire editorial piece about me, including pictures, and they've posted it on their front page. This has generated a huge amount of site traffic to my store and has made me a top Etsy seller. I'm differentiated from my competition mostly because my, merchandise stand, my merchandising stands out from everybody else. My products are merchandised with a darker aesthetic, more mysterious, more rustic. They appeal to both men and women, whereas other Etsy sellers tend to be a little bit more vanilla, and they all look the same. So my products stand out in the search. I've already achieved $39,000 in revenue in 2012, and I expect that by 2014, I will achieve $48,000 in revenue. This is if I keep doing exactly what I'm doing right now, where I buy products at a cost of $5 per item, and I sell them for around $35 an item. I have an 86% profit margin. Pretty generous. I, um, I'm the sole owner of the business. I do everything from photography, buying, merchandising, distribution, I do it all. I have a degree in visual communications from the Fashion Institute and Design and Merchandising in Los Angeles, and I have 12 years retail experience in roles such as buyer, merchandiser, store manager, etc. I've been doing it forever. I'm also earning an AA degree in entrepreneurship here at SVCC, so I can say this. If I win the $4,000, it's going directly into a business that's already been proven viable. My plan to use the funds is to use them to put it right into inventory. That would increase probably double my, double my revenues. I would also need to purchase a larger workspace for said inventory. Um, and then I would probably use a small budget for online advertising. I'm proven that with $500 in my pocket, I can start a business from scratch and quit my day job within a year, and that's all I do, full time. Thank you for your time. Judges? Anna, I really enjoyed your presentation. You did a great job. But I had two quick questions. Sure. One is, what are your growth plans? Right now, you're constrained by yourself. Do you yes. see this 
expanding? What do you Absolutely. where do you see it going? Ultimately, I would love to open a brick and mortar here in Santa Barbara. Um, I'd also, obviously, if my revenues increased, if I was able to double my revenues from what I'm already planning on doing, I would hire someone to do distribution entirely for me. Um, that way I'm not spending days and days out shipping product. <laughs> and what's in your cost of goods sold? Do you have a uh, salary for yourself in there? I do have it included. It's a small, small division. I pay myself out $1,000 a month. Okay. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, where do you warehouse the material, like the things that have been refurbished and are waiting to be sold? They're currently being stored in my one bedroom apartment. So if I was to increase inventory, I would be now getting a new industrial workspace to be storing everything. And you just distribute with like FedEx or UPS or something? Absolutely, like that? USPS. Okay. Thank you, Anna, it's excellent. Uh, just a quick question, what steps have you taken to strategize and protect yourself if someone comes along and copies your advertising or your business model? Good question. Um, I've looked into patents and copyrights. It's, it's definitely something that's costly. I'm familiar with what I need to do to do it, and I'm prepared to do that if and when I can actually increase my revenue to be able to financially support that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? One yeah, more? Just one more. And what's the average cost to refurbish an item? Um, the cost to refurbish it is virtually minimal, a couple dollars here and there. What I mean by refurbishing, it's actually a term coined upcycled. So for example, I might take an old baking tray and I will refurbish that into a chalkboard. So I'll take a coat of chalkboard paint, I'll put magnets on it, and that can be used as something entirely new. So the cost to, to change something up is no more than a couple dollars. Time is up, thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Matt Meyer uh, and I am the founder of Akkotree. When I uh, moved to Santa Barbara from Norway to become an international student here at Santa Barbara City College, I was met with an empty apartment. I had no idea where to go or what to do. So me and my roommate, we ended up going with what's familiar to us. And that's Ikea. So we rent a van, drove all the way down to Burbank, purchased everything for our apartment and they're being really expensive. To be specific, $3,500. Um, what if our apartment could be somewhat like this? Prior to our arrival even, and here's our solution. Convenient plus affordable student furniture rental. It's on a monthly basis, or they can take advantage of our buyback service, which means if they purchase a product from us, we will guarantee they will buy it back at their convenience, even if they're one day before they're leaving. And what's so special about us, all the students, they can browse on our website, uh, look at our products, and we serve them prior to their arrival at City College. And uh, if the landlord allows, we can have it all set up by the time they're here. And our delivery is free, setup is free. It's all about convenience for the student. Uh, another important, unique aspect of our business, all our furniture are recycled. I restore them or repurpose them and simply look, make them look nice and new. As you can see, there's billions of dollars in the retail and rental industry. In the long term, sure, we can be a part of that big billion industry nationally, but short term, we are focusing specifically on Santa Barbara City College international students. And we believe we can capture around 10% immediately the first year, uh, but there's a potential market uh, share of $150,000 in Santa Barbara. Our competition, they have no focus whatsoever on this specific target market. And we are gonna capture them already before they are uh, in Santa Barbara, which make us, uh, give us a competitive edge. Our marketing strategy has one simple goal, create excellent customer relationship. Our marketing campaign is based around Santa Barbara City College. We're gonna feature in the school newspaper. Uh, we're also uh, gonna speak in classes. Uh, we plan on doing blogging and also other social media um, uh, presence. We're also gonna take advantage of Google AdWords and direct mailing uh, to the area areas just around Santa Barbara City College where most students live. We also plan to offer uh, loyalty programs to the students, to our customers. If they refer uh, us to a friend 
or even if they continue to use our service, we will reward them. Uh, we also plan to upsell, which means that we are going to offer our customers upgrades to high-end furniture. But most importantly, our goal is to make our customers happy so they create a good word of mouth. Our distribution channels are mainly through virtual channels, like our website. We're also working towards a deal with uh, International Business School, uh, which is a Scandinavian uh, company. They are a student exchange program, and most of the students here from Scandinavia are part of that program. And they are part of an even bigger program that's globally recognized as STS Foundation. But more importantly, we have uh, talked to the housing coordinator, Michael Ayers, um, the, the senior director of the international program, uh, Carl Smith, and they're very excited uh, about our service, and they're more than uh, willing to partner with us to help us connect with the students prior to their arrival. Uh, and they will also give us the opportunity to uh, have tables on every orientation day, which is in, um, in uh, January and uh, August. We plan, um, we have a forecast that we have $35,000 in sales our first year, uh, anticipated to grow around 80% of the year three, where we, we, we will reach uh, almost $60,000 in sales. For simple, we are making, uh, we are breaking even in our first year, a short profit of uh, $1,200. Why will we succeed? We have 26 customers already said that they're ready to take advantage of our um, uh, service. We have made two sales already, um, and we have excellent mentors in uh, SBC staff and Antarctic University staff. Plus, we plan to be a client of the Small Business Development Center. Uh, we also have a great marketing and um, sales expert on our team with a bachelor in communication. We think it's really important that we can communicate the right way uh, with our customer. I personally have years of experience in carpentry, as a carpenter in Norway. I recently found my true passion in entrepreneurship uh, after I switched from an engineering student. I listen to advice. I also am never afraid to try. I always learn from my mistakes. And also, I never give up until I'm successful. Uh, we're seeking $30,000 investment in exchange for 15% equity. Use of the funds to include uh, tools and materials, roughly 5,000. Storage workshop, around 10,000. The rest is gonna be divided around on delivery and operating expenses, plus uh, some furniture uh, acquiring. I personally have experienced uh, how it is to be a international student moving abroad and what challenge it comes, challenges comes with that. And buying furniture is only one of them. Um, to re-emphasize our uniqueness, all our furniture is recycled. I do my, I find furniture, can be anywhere, I can pick it up, Craigslist. I mostly look for free to uh, have a low cost of goods, but also look at thrift stores, maybe to buy some cheap ones. Um, then I, if I see enough um, margins in the product. Also, I'm here to stay and live the American dream. And please help me be successful. Thank you for your time. Judges? I noticed that you said that there's a buyback guarantee. Yes. Uh, what happens if something's damaged? It's okay. We will be, it's our price that we offer the customer is based on how it looks. So if you're familiar with the cash flow book system, uh, if uh, you try to sell a book that you use for a semester and it's totally ripped apart, you don't get much for it. Same thing that we can do. But you will buy back no matter what? Yes. If I, I can fix... Mostly, I will guarantee I can fix everything. <laughs> Good answer. So, where are you going to be storing the furniture? Where? Well, we have a few options laid up. We have not uh, uh, settled in a location yet. We have a, a garage offer for them in the beginning. But there's also an opportunity as a, a warehouse in Glida where we haven't decided what we want to do yet. Maybe save some money, keep it small in the beginning. And garages can be just fine because we will use our storage. We'll rent the storage to keep, like, to have our finished products. So your financials, do they include the cost of a warehouse in Goleta? Yeah. 
or just... Well, no, it's actually that our financial is right now concluded for a garage. Okay, and the transportation, you have that in there as well? Yeah. And then I was a little confused because your financials showed that you did, you were, you had like $1,000 or something profit the first year. Yeah. So did you already put your $30,000 in there? No, I have not. So why do you need $30,000 if you're already breaking even, or you're, you've got a profit? It's, uh, well, it's mainly because for uh, acquiring startup costs. So the um, tools and some furniture we have to acquire, and um, also um, the delivery service. And then just a follow-up question, Matt. How, who else besides yourself has the knowledge and ability to do repairs and refurbishing on your furniture? I currently it's me. Uh, if it grows big enough, that I have to. Um, I will have to um, look into hiring a carpenter too. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Rossini, and I'm presenting my company, the Storefront Development Group. Um, first, uh, just a question to the audience. Does anybody in here scuba dive? Oh, that's good. Show of hands. I'm sure everybody likes it. Um, scuba diving is fun. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, probably my favorite sport in the world. Um, about two million people in the US are divers, uh, active divers. And the numbers there and the fanaticism surrounding diver, uh, divers creates what I would call a rabid market. Every diver that jumps in needs to have, at the low end, $5,000 of, of gear on their back um, and some upwards of 20000 Depends on what you're doing. Some people like to dive caves. Very expensive sport. Um, and they're buying that either online or from local shops. Um, and there's a problem that's emerging there. Uh, online is outselling local shops and crushing that market. Um, problem comes up when we don't see the dive shops there anymore. What do we do? Um, our new friends who want to dive can't get certified. Uh, we're lacking local knowledgeable experts. And where are we going to fill our dive tanks? It makes diving really difficult. Um, so my mission in creating the Storefront Development Group is to help local dive shops thrive. And here's how we'll do it. Uh, my idea was to contact the largest online scuba retailer in the world, uh, leisurepro.com, and set up an affiliate program between them and local dive shops. And I did convince Leisure Pro to allow local dive shops to affiliate and sell Leisure Pro goods to their customers. And you can imagine second was slightly more difficult, convincing dive shops to sell their online competitors' goods to the local dive shops, their customers. Uh, the, the partnership was brand new to both, uh, but it solves a fundamental problem. Uh, so I went to our local dive shop, Santa Barbara Aquatics, out in Goleta, and had this discussion. The program is now in place. And they are selling Leisure Pro products to their customers. Uh, our revenue model is simple. Uh, I make this match between the customer and, uh, or sorry, between Leisure Pro and the dive shop, and the shop earns 20, and Storefront Development Group earns five. Uh, the Storefront Development Group brings divers something that they want. Uh, a combination of local services and the convenience of online sales, uh, while at the same time putting money in the dive shop's pocket. Dive shops want this, the customers want this. And you might be asking yourself, well, why hasn't this done before, or is it being done? Uh, and it's not being done, and it hasn't been done before. Uh, Leisure Pro has not developed the core competency to make this match. And two, local dive shops uh, have been traditionally fiercely competitive with these online retailers until now. I've got the chemistry to make this match. I've been speaking dive shops since I was certified when I was 12. Uh, I'm an avid diver. I can see and clearly communicate value. Uh, I'm dedicated to high quality customer experiences. 
And friends know and will tell you um, that I'm a tireless advocate of the shop local movement. Uh, I am also an entrepreneur. Uh, I help build a local startup tech company. And over the course, have pulled in eight million in sales. And storefront development group is something I can do. Uh, so how do we get the word out? Uh, money on the table. The conversation with dive shops is simple. In 15 minutes, you could be making 20% of your biggest online competitor. That's 20% money on the table. That's your money on the table. And I'll bring this message to them through direct marketing, uh, referrals from other dive shops, and a website with simple media presentation of the process. Um, this model is also replicable. Um, the model could work for other brick and mortar versus online paradigms. That exists in a lot of places. You're probably all familiar with that right now. Uh, for example, um, just off the top of my head, uh, retail motorcycle uh, sales of accessories and jewelry shops. Uh, the market. Uh, there are 400 US dive shops strong in the United States. Uh, give or take those that uh, open and close every year. Uh, each of these needs 180 to 360,000, uh, depending on their location, their demographic, per year in annual revenues just to survive. And dive shops that I've talked to and brought this program to have said that they can sell with, uh, uh, within reason, $30,000 additional revenue per year. Uh, and that's a significant, significant increase in revenues uh, without much effort on their part. Uh, I wish I had put an affiliate link at the bottom. It's as easy as clicking that affiliate link from the comfort of your home or in the dive shop, entering your information. You make the sale, dive shop gets 20%. You get your goods and you keep your dive shop. Um, use of funds. Uh, the business scales with marketing. Uh, my projected growth is based on only $800 of direct marketing phone calls. That number can easily be increased, and it should be. Uh, any additional funding would scale the business uh, more quickly with increased direct sales efforts. Um, and larger funding would allow the storefront development group to scale into the additional vertical markets that are out there. Uh, the financial projections that uh, we worked up to see the storefront development group breaking even in the first year and annual revenues uh, roughly doubling each year. And uh, we see rapid growth and in the third year uh, projections of nearly 50,000 net profit. So the customer segment wants this. They're busy, they go home, and they haven't had time to go to the dive shop. They want to shop locally. Now they can't. The dive shops and other verticals want this. And for the online, it increases their market penetration. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. And do you have any questions? Judges? Thank you, Brian. Um, you mentioned the, the number of shops was 400 currently, dive shops across Approximately. The can you contrast that with, say, the last five and 10 years, perhaps, approximately, of how many shops there were in the US? Uh, yeah, 2009 uh, projections for number of shops. Um, it's difficult. And the one that's keeping track of this is an online and uh, in print periodical called Undercurrent. And in 2009, they were projecting there were about five to 600 shops, and that number is reduced to 400. And they see increase and decrease per year of approximately 600 shops. Big number. So you mentioned that they get a 20% margin on the Leisure Pro? Yeah, leisurepro.com. What's the margin they get on their, their regular product? 50 to 55. And what kind of margin is Leisure, Leisure Pro going to be able to make when they're paying that extra 20%? They're a sneaky company. Um, they've got uh, revenue or um, margins between 50 and 70%. They do a lot of gray market. And uh, so they'll be keeping upwards of 35% of a customer segment that essentially didn't exist for them before. They are increasing their market penetration. But they also, 
they may also be cannibalizing their online sales. Yeah, there are a lot of walk-away customers who come in, want something, don't buy something, walk out. And those customers don't necessarily shop online. There are very few people that I talk to that actually know about LeisurePro.com. And how do you capture the customer that comes in, sees the product at the brick and mortar store, but then goes home and orders it online? Um, that's actually not been something that the, the dive shops have been concerned about because they're capturing a customer uh, through, well, they could do that anyhow to begin with, see something and then leave. Uh, dive shops create the market and that market does want to return and purchase there, but they can't. There's no incentive to buy big ticket items in the dive shops. Your time is up. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Lynn Hartel, and I'm here today to present Remedy Fitness. I am a licensed doctor of physical therapy and Santa Barbara County's only board certified physical therapy sports specialist. My extensive sports background includes 10 years at the Division I level at UC Berkeley, treating athletes directly in the training room and on the field. Clients have included many NFL players and Olympians, including nine gold medalists. When patients first come to my private practice, they say one of two things. One, my injury was not resolved with other treatment or providers, or the problem was fixed temporarily but keeps coming back. They voice frustration with returning to sport and life activities and often report that yoga or fitness classes aggravate their symptoms. At any given time, more than 25% of Americans have pain or injury at an enormous cost to our society. Just one injury alone, low back pain, has a lifetime incidence of 80%. With baby boomers aging and healthcare reimbursing dropping, there is an immediate and growing need for quality, science-based fitness to address this significant problem. I am uniquely qualified to observe that there is an unmet need in the marketplace, and I have the training and experience to offer the solution. Remedy Fitness bridges the gap between rehabilitation and fitness. It is evolved from a proven method I developed for the Cal football team and taught to injured athletes so they could return to the weight room and practice. The method is taught in a movement class format set to cool music in an attractive space. Other key features include a physical therapist instructor and tracking progress every 10 sessions using scientific measures. Students can expect increased strength and mobility in key areas that contribute to injury. The key benefit is to return to doing the things that make you happy. Running, dancing, picking up your children, working in the garden. This really matters to people. One of the key differentiators is the direct link I make between the latest research, proven outcomes, and the exercise taught, exercises taught in the class. Here are some examples from recent scientific studies. In the photos on the right, the guy was wired with electronic EMG leads to measure muscle force in different core exercises, and the findings were quantified. This is the sort of scientific data I use to make decisions on the best positions and movements of the program. Market analysis shows that the fitness industry is a growth industry with demand especially for group fitness and programming for baby boomers. Also, local economic trends are favorable for establishing a business here in Santa Barbara. This is a highly competitive market, but no one is offering this unique service. The closest competitors are Bar Method and the Daily Method, which are ballet style workouts designed to firm your body. It is important to know that the fitness industry is totally unregulated and there are no requirements for education or training. 70% of fitness trainers do not even have a bachelor's degree in a related field. Anyone with a high school diploma can become a certified fitness trainer by taking a two-day course and a short exam. Proof of concept, proof that this concept is a viable business opportunity is based on two factors. The classes I taught in the UC Berkeley Sports Medicine Department became a standard component of returning athletes to sport. Physicians, trainers, and coaches regularly referred athletes to attend. 
It became so popular that space became an issue and athletes often overflowed into the next room. In addition, I taught two pilot classes at a local gym last month with a total of 10 students attending. This was followed up with an anonymous online survey. The response rate was 80% and strongly positive to the concept in class. 100% would recommend the class to friends and family and the average price they offered to pay was $16. Instruction, exercise, and other key features were rated highly. Students noted several unique features and 100% of them were interested in the feature of tracking progress with scientific measures. The pricing structure is based on existing successful pricing models. Drop-in rates are $20 and multi-passes bring pricing to the $16 per class range. I will fund the relatively low startup costs with, states, with savings. With fixed monthly expenses of $1,120, break-even will be reached within the first three weeks. Using conservative estimates, monthly revenue with just me teaching will be $8,000 a month. And each additional part-time physical therapy instructor will generate $4,000 per month. Total revenue at the end of year one is $144,000 with a net profit of almost $100,000. With a market share of only 5% of my target demographic, the local studio will have over 1,200 clients. <coughs> the target market is adult women and athletes. As women make 80% of healthcare and wellness decisions for the family, much of the marketing will be directed at this demographic. The marketing plan is strongly reliant on word of mouth and my key networks including local sports teams and healthcare providers. This plan will implement social media, a blog, an iPhone app, and content-based videos and advertorials. Initially the focus will be on developing branding and classes in Santa Barbara. As growth targets are achieved, we will open <coughs> studios in key markets in California, then regionally and nationally. Expansion includes instru instructor training programs and either a franchise or licensing model. New classes may include osteoporosis, total joint replacement classes, knee ligament protection classes, and Parkinson's. On the basis of my previous experience, and positive response to the pilot classes, I will be moving forward to establish this business. The trademark, uh, trademark application has been filed and I am currently seeking space to teach classes beginning in June. I would like to thank my management team, including my husband Mark, who as project manager keeps me on task, Melissa Moreno and Dr. John Anton, business development advisors, Judith Schelling, intellectual property advisor, Valerie Ellis, entrepreneur professor, as well as the entire Scheinfeld team. You guys were great, and this fantastic program gave me the structure and confidence to move forward with an idea I've had for a couple years. To close, I'd like you to imagine that you or someone you love has chronic low back pain or surgery. You've finished your physical therapy, but you're not 100%. Are you going to trust your body to a high school graduate with two days of training? Remedy Fitness offers its, a skilled scientific fitness solution to improve strength, mobility, and function so you can return to doing the things that make you happy. Thank you. Well, I just had a thought. Justin, one of our judges, um, wouldn't have done his entrepreneurship project if he hadn't gotten injured. So you ha you're, you're, you're speaking to the choir over here with Justin. So anyway, uh, questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I buy into the fact that you're the right person to, you know, to teach people how to do this or how to you know, get better and get back into sports. But what is it going to take for you to train people to do the same thing that you can do? Um, one of the things that's really important to me in this business is that, um, first of all, the person getting trained is a healthcare professional. It might not be a physical therapist, it might be a chiropractor or a nurse or someone with some sort of health professional training, but um, that's the first step because their medical background will take them a long way into protecting the students. Um, and secondly, 
first initially will be an apprenticeship program in Santa Barbara, and then later really in-depth training programs of weeks and weeks of training. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. It seems that uh, you presented very well and explained what differentiates you. How will you be able to convey that level of information in a marketing plan with someone who will just be have a brief time to take a look at why they should choose your business? I would say from personal experience. Um, in my own personal private practice, um, it, I did stats on the, my private practice in the Bay Area. About 90, 85 to 90%, all word of mouth. I, it's, it's once people find something that works, they will do anything to get better. Um, I recently had a volleyball athlete from Cal contact me a few months ago. She lives in Pomona. She drove up three hours, four hours from Pomona. And she told me, she said, your back class was the only thing that helped me through volleyball. And she, I had seen her after she had had back surgery. She came to me as an athlete. And she said, I need your help because I'm not doing well. And so once people get that it works, there's, that's just it. They'll, they'll do anything. Judges, are you ready Time's for up. the next presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Susan, Christopher, and Justin, audience, as you can hear, I have been working on this pitch all week long. That is why I have unconveniently lost my voice this morning. So I'm sorry if you can't understand what I'm saying completely. Now, I know I'm not the typical 6'6", six 260-pound six, guy telling you that I can run a million-dollar company but I am a businesswoman driven to not only make profit with a brand that I'm passionate about, but also change an industry that so many are too afraid to touch. I came to the school to learn how to be a successful entrepreneur, and that is exactly why I created Go Surfwear. As you know, here in the California coast, we are surrounded by surfing, not only the sport, but the lifestyle as well. I myself am a surfer, and my friends and I are sick and tired of companies making wetsuits for us girls just so we stop complaining about how cold the water is. Could you imagine this wetsuit on me? It's unattractive. That is why I have taken on the challenge of making the perfect wetsuit that is not only stylish, but functional as well. These are just two of the designs that I have created for the company. Most surfwear companies portray that all of us girls are frills and flowers. That is not true. This wetsuit company shows the true beauty and strength of a woman who is surfing. This is for the girls who are not sitting on the beach taking pictures of the boys in the water or in the water with the boys. All Go Surfwear products are manufactured here in America. I strongly believe in building the economy of our country, and the only way to do that is to create and build within it. The neoprene being used for all Go Surfwear products has been labeled the world's best neoprene. It has broken the world record in Olympic for swimming. It received most recognition in the Beijing Olympics because it did break that world record, and now it is banned from future Olympic Games because it is considered an unfair advantage to competitors. As you can see, Lara Croft is, Angelina Jolie is posing as Lara Croft in the Hollywood film Tomb Raiders. So it has also received the Hollywood fame. <coughs> the target market for Go Surfwear is women in between the ages of 17 to 35. That is when women are most active in the sport of surfing. These girls are heavily involved in social media, predominantly Facebook and Instagram. Most of the surfing population in America is located here in California. In 2010, $110.4 million in wetsuit sales alone were made. The marketing strategy for Go Surfwear is quite simple and it engages with the consumer. As you can see, social media is a big pull. All women love a good deal. Even the chance to win something fires us up. That is why, by creating promotions, the consumer not only engages with our customers, with our company, but we're also able to see what they truly want so we can make the best products for them. Brand awareness is a big part of the strategy as well. By having apparel made for both men and women with the logo on it, we are able to have receive recognition from the surfing culture, as well as have extra funds to go back into the company for further development. 
Here is the model of how GoSurfo will run. We put the products in the local shops here in Santa Barbara, which I have spoken to the current buyers in the local area, and once they see the wetsuits are in production, they're interested in having the products in their stores. The consumers then buy from the shops, and it promotes the, the company as well as the local businesses here in town. Same goes for the online. We will have our own GoSurf for a full e-commerce website where consumers can buy directly from us. Here are the financials. So as you can see in the revenue, that includes the wetsuit and apparel sales. The gross margin is 68% in the first year, minus all the operating expenses and other expenses, and within the first year we expect to make $9,458. That means in the first year of Go Surfwear, we are a $90,000 company. I will remain the CEO of the company. I will hire an advisory I will hire an operations manager when the systems are in place, as well as an advisory team to make sure the company is functioning correctly. With $40,000, GoSurfer can have the first line of wetsuits completed and ready for the consumer to purchase, as well as a full e-commerce website. With the $4,000 from the new venture challenge, that will go towards the apparel and the pattern making for the first line of wetsuits. As I showed you in the financials, this is a company that I plan to keep and have grow for years and years to come, not to sell to somebody else to take the idea. This company is more than just a business, so I can take surf trips and write it off as if it's just a business expense. This is a brand that I am determined will compete against the, most, the top surfer companies in the industry. The surfing world has been begging for a fresh face, and Go Surfer has accepted the challenge. Thank you for your time. So you were talking about neoprene as being the material that you're going to use. Yes. What's, what's currently being used on the market for wetsuits? It is neoprene. It's just this specific neoprene. The technology that is used and patented makes it so it can be an ultra thin mill and keep you warm, as well as um, there's zero drag in the water so you can have the highest performance. But your competition is currently using the same material that you're proposing oh, no. to use? Mm -mm. Everybody else uses um, this material. You can feel it for yourself. It's made out of all um, aesthetic materials, and the neoprene I'm using is made out of 98% limestone. Okay, and then to follow up with that, are you looking to only sell to females, or are you going to go for both genders? At the moment, just females, but the apparel will be for both and male and women. But once the company branches out, I am looking into making what's used for men. Just a quick question here. I just wanted to know how much more uh, the cost would be to have the suits made here in America versus having them made elsewhere. Right, right. It costs $30 to make a wetsuit here in the States, and I'll be selling it for retail $250. It's actually 2% less expensive to manufacture here in the States because of shipping fees. So if the material is so much superior, why aren't the other um, companies using it? It's a material that it is hard to get in contact with a company unless you have an inside contact, which I have. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming out and spending your Friday with us. I know a lot of you usually have Fridays off, but thanks for coming in. Um, it's a serious question. How dependent on your gadget are you? How many of you out there have a phone in your pocket? For those of you with your hands not up, I'm sorry you lost it last night or you broke it. <laughs> um, let's start with your typical day. You wake up in the morning because your alarm went off. Hang out. You get dressed, you eat some food, you need to know what's going on in the world, so you read the news. News is great, it's usually bad news. I read it all the time. But then you gotta check your calendar, you know, who are you meeting today? What time do you need to be there? Where do you need to be? Should you wear shoes and, or sandals? Can you go to the beach for lunch? Better check the weather. Then you need to make sure that you're gonna be on time for your first meeting. So you need to know exactly where you're going. Better map it. 
But before you walk out of the house, your dog's just got the cutest look you've ever seen on his face. Better take a quick picture of that. You might need to share it later. <laughs> then you get a little more distracted. You're going to surf the web a little bit, check your mail, and then you're going to tell your friends about it on Facebook and Twitter. So you're pretty dependent on it. In fact, I'm up here right now. I've got one, two, three, four. Four gadgets just right here, right now. So what happens, it's Thursday night, got a mug of whatever you want, and you just lost it all, all of it. No more contacts, uh, no more Facebook, no more Twitter. You just lost all the pictures. You can't get to your first appointment tomorrow. <laughs> I've had this face, many of you have had this face. So what do you do about it? You can uh, go over to the store and you can buy a brand new phone. Uh, right now, a new iPhone is going to cost you about $650. But you're not going to get your photos back, you're not going to get your contacts back, you're not going to get all the, the pins for your map back, that's all gone. You can call your insurance company, they're going to tell you, ah. Uh, $250, depending on your plan, and we'll mail you one. You'll get it in three days. You still lost your photos, your contacts, your text messages. It's gone. Or there's another option. You can bring your phone, tablet, computer to one of my CPR locations. We have one in Northridge and one in Woodland Hills. And most repairs can be done in 20 minutes. You're in and you're out the door. All of them, most of them, I should say, for a fraction of the cost. We're talking $60, $70 for water damage, and you can have it back the same day. We also give you a six-month nationwide warranty. CPR is a franchise, and we have a chain of 120 of them across the nation. So if you get a warranty here in West LA, break your phone in New York, <clears throat> take it into the CPR, they'll take care of it for you. And if you're very clumsy and you break your things all the time, We'll give you a better insurance plan that has full coverage. Cover water damage, screen damage, anything like that. There are 6 billion active mobile phone subscriptions worldwide right now. 6 billion of them. There's 7 billion people on the planet. To put that into perspective for you, if we evenly distributed all those phone subscriptions and gave each person one of them in the world, Every single person aged 9 to 100 would have a mobile phone subscription. And that doesn't even get into tablets, GPS, uh, MP3 players, all kinds of gadgets. Almost 120 of them in 2012, and just in tablets. And your average home? Humor yourself. When you get back, if you live with more than two people, start going through your house and counting how many remotes. Uh, tablets, computers, phones that you actually have. Opens up a pretty big uh, market for repairs. Real big. Now I'm not saying that my stores are going to go out there and going to make 1.5 billion dollars. Because they're not. It's, they're just not going to do that. But what I will tell you is that one of my stores has a market share of $360,000 per year. Conservatively. How do we get it to them? Well, if you have a phone, a tablet, computer, chances are you've used Google, Bing, Yahoo, any of that stuff, and you know how to use a search engine. It's fairly cheap, and it runs when we're not. It runs 24-7. If you were to right now pull out your cell phone or computer and Google cell phone repeller, West LA, CPR would come up. We also use Facebook based solely on the fact that you know it's Facebook on that app and it's on your phone and computers. Craigslist is big too. Uh, a lot of people, if you're looking for cheap stuff, used stuff, where do you go? Craigslist. You don't go to Walmart. Well, you might. And lastly, I actually go on foot to every single service provider around those two stores, including Best Buys, Costco, Sprint, T-Mobile, all of them. There's about 70 of them close to the two stores. 
Each store, as I said, gets 360,000 market share. Of that, on the low end, we're netting 30% of that. That's 109,000 conservatively every year for each one of the stores. It's good stuff. And see what happens when your gadgets fail? Right there. Now, now I'm in a panic because something's happened here. So we have two stores. Um, they're set to close escrow uh, at the mid-May. Uh, the deal on them, it's $100,000 for the assets for the two stores, plus we need $20,000 of operating capital for both of them. I myself have invested $30,000 to enter into escrow, and we need another $110,000. So what I'm asking for is $110,000 on a five-year loan at 8%. Eight. Eight. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, November 2011, I started Santa Barbara Wireless Medics. Within six months, it got out of control. I couldn't keep doing school, couldn't keep my customers happy. So I had to make up my mind. Franchise, buy into a franchise. I got lucky and these two stores were available just a few months later. That's fine. My name is Jared Cody Buck and I've already have these businesses. They're in escrow one way or another. I'm going to close on them by the end of the month and your next business venture should be with me. Thank you. Jared, I have a question for you. The two um, franchises that you're purchasing, what, what was their revenue and their profit last year, and then why are they being sold? Uh, the revenue and profit last year was right around 110 for the two stores. Um, they're being sold for multiple reasons. The current seller, he's not familiar with the industry. He's a serial entrepreneur. He goes in, he starts businesses, and he sells them. He doesn't actually go to the stores and market and bring them up to their true market potential. The industry, he's the lowest of the industry standards. But he bought the franchises? He bought into the franchises, yes. It costs about 55 to 87 to buy into them. So on paper, they pay themselves off after a year. And he went to with that mindset that I will build it and they will come and it doesn't really work that way for him. So he wants out. Okay. How, how long has uh, the previous franchise owner's store been open? Two years, both Two of years. them. And then also, you were saying that um, it's a same-day repair and that the competitors can't do that and also that you guys have a better cost. Yes. What's the average difference in cost between your competitor and then your, or your store? Um, it ranges from device to device, but right now our biggest range, right now our competitors have to pay $280 just for a part for your iPhone 5, and I pay $10 for it. And that's because of the franchise system that's been set up? It's a part of the franchise system, and I actually have a machine that I'm patenting that refurbishes the devices. Okay. And last question, I just wanted to know, who else is offering this kind of repair that you're offering here, both in the Valley and both here? iFix U-Brake is the only nationwide company that's doing it. Um, there's a lot of mom and pop shops. Um, I was one of them, Santa Barbara Wireless Medics. Hi, I'm Matt, and I invented the adder, which is the product that the judges now have in their hands. Now, unlike many of these other presentations you've seen today and will see today, I am not going to give you a whole lot of fluff or a whole lot of excitement. I'm going to give you just the facts and show you how my product is viable. Now, I really hadn't expected to be up here of all places at the end of the semester. I mean, this, this certainly has never been the kind of thing I usually like to do, but I was taking a business class. And I heard about the Enterprise Launch Club, and I decided I should probably do something to get myself out there and kind of differentiate myself. And so I went to the club, and I sat in on the first meeting, and there's these mentors who are just running everywhere, back and forth, talking to all, the, all different people, getting different ideas, trying to get them to come up with something. And I'm just sitting there trying to figure out who it is that's actually running this place. <laughs> and so finally, when I got to sit down with some of them, they kept saying to me, there must be something you have, must be some, some kind of idea, something you could do. 
I just said, no, 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 I, don't, I can't think of anything. There's nothing that I do. Nothing really. And they said, no, come on, there has to be something. And well, I came up with something. So one of the problems that I really noticed at home was that whenever my dad would try to cook something like a tri-tip, he would always take it and rub it with sauce and meat, not meat, spices. And he'd always try to put chunks of garlic deep into it, but he'd never really have a good way to do that. He'd always be trying to cut into the meat and shove it down in. It never really worked well. So I decided that I would go down to Sir Le Tab on um, State Street, which, for those of you who don't know, is a very high-end kitchenware store. And I asked them if they had any products that were like this. And they said, no, no, we, I've never seen, heard anything like that. But we'd love to have something like that. They just We haven't found anything. So I wasn't sure what to do. Some of the things that we'd like to put on the meat are like garlic and basil, and we didn't really have a good way to do it. So my solution to this problem was to create the adder, which consists of a rod and a tube with a funnel. It's made out of stainless steel. It's very simple and easy to use, very simple to clean. It's very durable. It's very easy to make. So let me just give you a demonstration of how this works. First. You take, you put the tube and the rod together, and you find a good spot on the meat, and you stick it in. You pull the rod out, and you put in your garlic and your, your black pepper, and of course, if you're my dad, you stop there, because those are the only spices that exist for him. <laughs> but you put in your spices, whatever you need. You reinsert the rod, push it all in, pull it out, and that's it. You just repeat it wherever you need it. It's very, very simple and easy to do. So there are many products that are similar to this, but nothing that really can do the same things. There are, for example, like this meat injector right here. It only functions for liquids, and it's made out of glass. This is made out of cheap plastic. It's not very good, also liquid only. And this one is, it's a bit nicer, but it's a lot more expensive, and it, yet again, works only for liquids, really. So there's nothing that really can compete. So my, what I've determined here is that our target customer is obviously people who love to cook. I mean, who else could I sell it to? And they generally tend to be people who are 40 year old or people who could afford to buy something like this. And in general, they are mostly women. Although there is a very great application for barbecuing, which as I said before, is how I originally got the idea. Because we love to eat meat all the time. So I had to have some sort of way to make it taste great. So the, the very best part about this, pro this product for me is how I get to make it. I make it in my garage with the help of my grandfather. We use all off-the-shelf materials, so it's very, very easy to scale it up to other job shops in the area. We get a major, major savings with large orders. And you know, this is, this is my passion. I love to do this kind of stuff. It's, I love to work with my hands and make stuff. I mean, as it is, we ran out of material one day, and I was trying to figure out what could I do with the time I had. I, was, I had nothing to do. So I went and I found some titanium that we had, and I decided to make myself a ring out of titanium. It took me four hours, but I got it done exactly the way I wanted it, in the best possible condition, exactly how I like to work. So our financial projections show that we will, or should be breaking even with selling 200 units a month in month three. Our cost per unit is $3.50, $0.54. And our income per unit is $28.19. Our operational income at the end of this year will be $42,472. For marketing and distribution, I plan to open a retail store online, though. I plan to be start out and become an eBay seller and take in orders over the internet. Shipping will be through USPS, so there's my distribution. It's a very simple and practical way to get to a very wide customer base to start out. Now, the money that I really need to run this is the $4,000 from this competition. This is what I need to scale up to the financial projections I showed earlier. $2,000 would go towards buying materials, $1,000 would go towards the patent process, and $1,000 would go towards my eBay account. Now, really, why would you want to work for me? Why should you work for me? Well, you know, I'm definitely not the best looking person in here. I could probably point out a few other people here, <laughs> but I probably shouldn't. I'm definitely not a fancy talking salesman. That's, that's certainly not the way I like to do things. And I'm, I'm certainly not funny. <laughs> but what I am is trustworthy. I'm dedicated to this. I know the technology, and therefore I am the most likely to succeed. 
Thank you for the opportunity. Can I take your order now? <laughs> Judges? Thank you. You're doing a very nice job. Um, I have a question. So if you scaled up and machine shops started doing the production, how would that affect your cost structure? Well, the cost structure should go down because using certain, using a CNC lathes in the area, it's all done through computers. So it's very, very easy to get a fixed cost for each individual one, which will be lower than it costs me to make it myself. Did you get estimates? Have you talked to them? I have not done that yet because it has not been needed yet. That is next on the list. Okay. What's the cost per unit to build one currently with you and your grandpa? And then what are you, what's the retail selling point? Um, for just materials, it's $3.54. And I'm, since I'm making it myself, I'm just going to average out 10 to $10 an hour for uh, labor because it doesn't take a whole lot of work to do it. And then we're going to sell it for about $30. Did that answer your question completely? Um, yeah, that did. And my follow-up question to that would be, what's the capacity that you and your grandpa can produce these at per week? Like how many can you get going? Per week for the moment? Well, six per day, so six, 42 a week. So not a large amount, but I don't have a large amount, large demand yet, which is why we would use the other job shops in the area to because they have a better capacity to make them than I do. Thank you. Thanks, man. Just a question on the patent. I love the simplicity of the design. Um, how long would it take you to expect to get an answer on that patent, whether that's going to work for you or not? I don't know. I just submitted the provisional application last week, so I don't know how long it actually takes them to get back to me. I'll be seeing that soon. Okay, thank you. Wow, that's a hassle. And that's a problem a lot of people have. They find an awesome ball in Craigslist, but they can't get it, either because they don't have the time, the strength, or a, or a truck. <laughs> uh, so what if I were to tell you that my friend here will never have to go through that problem again? How, you ask? Craig Fetch. And by the way, that's my partner, Alfred Pacheco. Come on. <laughs> small-scale local retrieval service that specializes in, in fetching items purchased on Craigslist, <laughs> such as this. <sighs> All right, so why Craigslist? Well, as you see, there's hundreds of Craigslist throughout the country, as well as worldwide, which all pose potential franchise opportunities for Craigslist fetch. But we're going to focus on establishing ourselves in Santa Barbara. Specifically, the reason why, if you look in the furniture section, there's over 300 postings of furniture daily. We estimate that at least 50 of those are being sold, and at least half don't have trucks. Postings such as this, as you see here, there's a nice sofa bed, good price, but if you look at the description, it says you must have your own truck and be able to carry down a flight of stairs on your own. That's a tough job. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a tough job for anyone. But that's a job Craig Fitch would love to do. So, how Craig Fitch works. It's simple. Simply pick up your phone and call Craig Fitch, 805-768-HELP. Write it down. Alright, once you're on the phone, you give us the item, the date and time that's most convenient, and the pickup and drop off destination. After the appointment set up, a credit fetch employee will have the item in front of your house and place it exactly where you pictured it, all at a simple price. What is it? Well, for a one person fetch, it's $25 an hour. For a two person fetch, it's $50 an hour. <clears throat> so, where is credit fetch marketing as now? We are servicing 15 mile radius from Santa Barbara city limits, which goes from Goleta all the way down to Carboneria. And we're focusing 
on people who don't own trucks. Specifically, non-family households, which are 65 and up or live alone who don't own trucks. Our primary target market are single, divorced, or widowed women who have Who have uh, some college or a graduate's degree that's middle to upper class who don't own a truck. Our secondary part, target markets are college students who don't own trucks and renter occupied households who don't own trucks. So, revenue. How do, how do we make revenue? Simple. We receive a call, we go for the fetch, we deliver the fetch, we make revenue. <clears throat> so, how do we plan on marketing to these customers? Well, currently, we are posting ads on Craigslist, which is completely free and creates a lot of exposure. We also want to contact sellers on Craigslist, letting them know that if they include our service, their item will be sold faster and a lot more hassle-free for both the seller and the buyer. <clears throat> we have, we're, start, we're starting a community on, on Facebook, add us, or like us, <clears throat> and local advertising, newspaper, radio, let the, spread the word. <clears throat> our financial projections. So how much can one truck and two guys make? Well, currently, with minimal marketing and only a couple weeks, we've managed to generate a revenue of $820. <clears throat> so, with that, we have a projected revenue for this fiscal year of $64,180. Now, if we add a truck and two more guys, which we have coming in in November, we have a, a financial projection of a revenue of $94,180. So if you see here, with a revenue of $94,180 and a cost of $54,692, we have an operating income of $34,783 this year, with a gross margin of 50%. So our break-even analysis. Our break-even is $1,529, which includes license fees, permits, um, cost for <laughs> transport, and our break-even hours is 21 single person, and, two, and 22 persons. So far, like I said, we have $820 down. We only need 700 down to go. Our team? Well, I myself have many years experience in fine dining and hospitality, and I like to implement that in all our Craig Fetch services. My, my partner, Alfred Pacheco, has much business experience. He has web design, and he has product development experience. And of course, our, our truck blue dog, <laughs> Together, we'll form, together we form the perfect business team that can launch Craigfetch and be a, a recognized worldwide franchise. <clears throat> so investors funds needed. Because we have such a low startup fee and we're already generating revenue, we actually don't need any investor funds. So what are we going to do with the 4000 Well, we're going to double our profits by going to Vegas, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. We'll buy a new truck. We estimated by November we'll have... We estimated by November we have a new truck, but if we win this competition, we'll be able to get a new truck by August. And that will double our profit and also insure us just in case one truck goes out. <clears throat> like this. So, happy customers. This right here, her name is Misty. She, she, she saw an awesome buy on Craigslist, but she had no way of retrieving it. So, she had the opportunity to actually call Craigfetch. Next thing you know, we're outside her house with everything she wants. She let us in her house happily, and in less than an hour, we have her whole bedroom furnished and nice and livable. So instead of being sad living on a bare room floor, she was thankful for us to be there for her. And she couldn't have been any happier, thanks to Craigfetch. And here's some other customers we've helped throughout Santa Barbara in these past couple weeks. <clears throat> so, future customers. We've been receiving emails like this constantly from our Craigslist ads. What a great idea. I'll forward this to my friends of mine that would otherwise shy from purchases due to transport issues. And I love it. When I need you guys, I'll call you a good call. I'll pass it along. So, as you can see, my partner and I, Alfred Pacheco, Carter Haynes, we have the potential to take Craig Fitch to be a worldwide franchise, just as 1-800-GOT-JUNK and all those other truck, trucking companies. So, it's not a matter of if Craig Fitch will become successful, it's a matter of how successful Craig Fitch will become. Thank you.
So I'm assuming that the first truck, you're not counting that as an expense because you already had it? Um, it's my trip right now. I'm releasing it for free until we make enough margins to pay for it. And then what would be the cost if you wanted to get a new truck? The cost for a new truck with the kind of trucks that we use, which are uh, high MPG trucks, um, would be only around $4,000 to $5,000. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so have you run through your, your margins and putting in the costs for your time and gas and everything? Yeah, we, we actually pay our, our employees high. It's $10 an hour for our employees. And then we include the gas that it takes to do the trip. So it comes out to a 50% 50, 50 margin. And either one, so one person um, fetch, we only use one laborer, so the cost goes down for us. And then a two person fetch, are, it's two people who are, that's why we increase the price. It's, is there a mileage component to the pricing? Like what if I lived farther away? Well, we're only, we're, we're only servicing from Goleta to Carpinteria. So we've had, we estimated the time from the typical leader to Carpenter is only 30 minutes and it's not too much with mileage. We like to keep it local. We plan to expand the franchise. And what's the barrier to entry for someone else? I mean, can I start up uh, Justin Fetch mm -hmm. in Santa Rosa and yeah, do exactly. it myself? So you could start, but we'd already be a lot ahead of you. People are already starting to know us and we're getting referrals constantly. Everyone we service has always said they're going to use our service either again or they get a request to a friend. Also, if you saw the brand image, turn it we actually have a pretty, we actually have a pretty good logo. So that's that's what. <laughs> that's good. We really like it. Uh, just a quick question: Have you had any contact from Craigslist re regarding using the name Craig for your business? Oh, okay, so we've looked into the into the names, and there's actually there's actually no infringement with Craigslist. You can finish. Okay, yeah, there's actually no infringement with Craigslist, and we're actually have the files formed to trademark the name. We're just going to have the attorney look over it and send it in. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cindy Gutierrez, and I'd like to start off by telling you a little bit about myself. I am a mother of two wonderful children, great kids. I am a proven seamstress. I took fashion designing in the 90s. I'm a student here at San Barbara City College and I'm a massage therapist. I've been doing massage for quite some time now. And the reason I chose to take the side class is because I'm really tired of working for other people. I want to launch my own company and have it be successful. But in all honesty, I'm just really tired of giving massages. I want to start receiving them. <laughs> So what pain does my product address? When you have an injury, such as a sprained ankle, knee, arm, lower back, your physical therapist or orthopedic doctor will recommend that you wear a supportive brace, such as these. Now the problem with these is they can be very uncomfortable. They create chafing, bacterial skin infestation, such as itching, unpleasant odor, Here's an example of somebody chafing from a lower back brace. Now, doesn't that look uncomfortable? That's like injury on top of injury. So my solution to this pain is that I have developed an anti-chafing, breathable, washable, double-layered liner that's used to protect the skin against the abrasiveness that's often associated with a supportive brace. I call my product Embrace. I'd like to welcome my model, Lauren. She is going to demonstrate the embrace sleeve for the arm and the embrace sleeve for the knee. Now, please notice it is reversible, comes in multiple colors and designs. She's got the one for the wrist, and she's got a wristband on the other side, a wrist brace. So they do come in various lengths. She's got the knee, and the knee has a, a gripper on the top part of it. So that will not slide down. You can walk upstairs and walk around and it won't come down. So my target market, my target market is physical therapists and orthopedic surgeons. There are over 100 in the Santa Barbara County. This alone represents a, a 20,000 units per year. You multiply that by $10, that's 200,000 annual revenue. My business goal, is to prove the concept than to sell to a large company. 
And what I've learned through this process, through Dr. Brian Cable, the orthopedic surgeon, he's taught me that because the, the sleeve is double layered and it's a tight fitting, it is considered a compression wrap and therefore paid for by the uh, patient's insurance company, which makes it a slam dunk for the physician's profit profitability. So Embrace is bottom line friendly. So manufacturing, how do I plan to manufacture my product? Well, as I said in the beginning, I am a seamstress. So initially, all of the manufacturing will be done in-house. And once the volume of sales increases, I plan to hire selective applicants to help build the Embrace sleeve. These are my high-end sewing machines. And um, this one over here is a serger. It's got five spools on it. And it does like an overlock stitch. And it works very well with the knit fabrics that I use. And it actually cuts the fabric off at the same time. The other one over here is a push button. That's the one my husband uses. All you need to do is push the button, and it just sews it right. You can walk away, and it will continue to sew. So my cost, my pricing, and my margin. For one yard of fabric, it cost me $9. I can make six double layered liners in one hour. Therefore, my cost of materials is $1.50. With the labor on top of that, at a fixed price per unit, that brings my cost to $3.50. If sold for $10, that gives me a margin of $6.50. I sell to the orthopedic doctors for $10, and they bill their insurance company, the patient's insurance company, for $20. It's a very simple business model. So selling through resellers, the Santa Maria Valley Physical Therapy Group and the Central Coast Orthopedic Medical Group are two of the places that are carrying my product. So my financial model results. Within five months, I will be, be at a positive cash flow. Break even at 450 units sold per month. Maximum downstroke will be a little over 2,000 in month three. My operating income at the end of the first year will be over $25,000. So the sources of funds. 4,000 for winning first place today, 10,000 from an investor for 10% equity, in exchange for 10% equity, and the uses, uses of the funds will be 4,000 for marketing, 3,000 to cover the worst case month, and 7,000 to cover the bulk of the materials. So my exit strategy. There are two major uh, brace companies, one of which is Hanger, the other is Healy and Weber. Now these brace companies work right alongside the orthopedic doctors and physical therapists. It's, what, it's um, where the physical therapists and orthopedic doctors order their braces from. So when they order their brace, they'll order the embrace sleeve right alongside it. So five simple and compelling reasons why I think my business is viable. I am the management team, and I will subcontract everything at a fixed price. I've received proven customer satisfaction feedback from actual sales, and I have a functional self-service website, and I need very little upfront money to launch. I do pl plan to pursue this full time, and my product really does help relieve customers of unnecessary pain. Thank you, Cindy. Um, regarding the product itself, is there anything that is can be patented or makes this unique to prevent someone else from copying your design? Here? Um, I do have a patent pending on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. What are you looking to patent about it? Um, the fact that it's double layered um, makes it different from other sleeves. Is this a unique sleeve material? Um, no, it's just made of spandex. A lycra and polyester. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you said you're going to subcontract at a fixed price. What did you mean by that? Um, they will be paid two dollars, like per unit that they build. 
Okay, and how long does it take for someone to build one unit? Well, I could build one, in, I can build six in one hour. So hopefully. So it's $12 they, an hour? They will, yeah, it, it comes out to about $12 an hour. But like once you get really good at it, I mean, you could just crank these things out. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paulo, and I am that six foot three guy that weighs 200 pounds that the surfer girl was talking about. <laughs> so I was born on a farm. I went to Cal Poly and got a degree in agriculture. From there, I went to work for a company consulting farmers on different types of fertilizers. Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I worked in the corporate world, and I've learned a lot how to manage people, how to deal with people, and so on. But I'm actually sick and tired of working for someone else. I want to work for myself. So I got online and I looked for a way to learn how to start my own business. And I came across a 16-week course at Allen Hancock. I jumped on it immediately. I got put on a team, and we decided to start a fertilizer company, of all things, right up my alley. So let me tell you a little about it. <coughs> There's a billion pounds of coffee that's thrown away each year. That is equivalent to 100 rail cars full to the brim, going straight to the dump. That costs money. That's tax dollar money, your money and my money. We have a solution. Our solution is to collect free coffee grounds from Starbucks, McDonald's, Panera Bread, Lazy Acres here locally, and if necessary, all, all one billion pounds. Now, Starbucks will actually give this stuff away, but most people don't even want it. In my experience, Panera Bread had a sign out that said, come co collect free coffee grounds, and they put it by the door so you just pick it up. People actually thought a trash can and threw their stuff in it. So, why don't people like it? Because it's yucky and wet, like Lauren's going to show you. So we use a patent drying facility. And in our patent drying facility is four shelves. We take our yucky muck, we put it in there, and inside the facility has got a um, dehumidifier. It literally sucks the moisture out, completely dries it, no matter what the weather's like outside. And from there, we get our black gold, right there, that you can put all over your plants. After that, we package it in one of our packages. Judges, on the front of our package, well, go back a bit. What is the one thing that people always look for when they go to buy any type of fertilizer? They want to know what the nutrients is, what plants are going to take up. Well, we put it on there, our NPK, your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Second of all, the plants that it works best on. Well, it works on all the plants. However, these work a little bit better. You guys can ask me a little later in the Q&A. Bottom of the package, you have um, a barcode. We're ready for retail. We own it, scan it, let's go. You flip the package on the back side, few things it takes care of. For one, it raises the city level. For you scientific folks, it drops pH. Two, it keeps snails away. So you plant a nice garden, you don't have to worry about these snails eating up everything. And three, it keeps your neighbor's cat, maybe your cat, out of using your garden as a litter box. Below that, it's made in America by Americans, not somewhere else. And we also have a patent pending. Now our first mode of sale is our website. Go on our website, it's self-serving, get what you want, a few days is at your house. Second mode of sale is we plan to use Starbucks Panera Bread. Why not sell back to the people that actually make coffee? And also the people that buy, we're more likely to buy our product are people that drink coffee and are environmentally conscious. Now, our third way of sale, which is right up my alley, is I took this bag and I went to my buddy Mike and I said, hey man, what do you think about trying out my product? He liked it, he really liked it. He goes, I want four truckloads tomorrow. I said, whoa, whoa, buddy, take it easy. Let's wait a little bit. Let me get the company started and I'll get you something here as soon as possible. He says, I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna call the CFO and get to, and get to order Q. 500 pounds at $2.50, which is equivalent to 1,250 bucks. Now, my buddy Mike's got 500 acres. He can actually use 50,000 pounds, which is $125,000. Customer feedback. 85% of the people that we interviewed are gardeners to some level. 65% of those people are females. Most women buy most of the product for their houses. 58% live on a quarter acre, but don't drink enough coffee to cover it. And that's where we come in. 74% did not, did not use their own coffee grounds. They just toss it in the trash. 62% 
would pay 10 to $15 for our product. The bottom line is we create a convenience for these people. So here's a little summary. So judges, you have uh, my business plan in front of you. I'll give you a little summary real quick. You have your labor, packaging, shipping, electricity. The total COGS, 82 cents per pound. $3.28 for a four pound bag. We retail at seven bucks. Net profit is 372. Gross margins, 113. Operating income for the first year, $85,000. Now remember the 74 people that didn't know what to do? Well, we have, we have a solution for that. We created the Tumblr. Here, instead of throwing your stuff in the trash, you take it, put it inside the Tumblr, has a screen in the front and the back, and also has got paddles, just like a clothes dryer. You crank it over, and it slowly dries your stuff. Not all at one time, but it will dry it. We can add a fan, we can add a motor, it does a lot quicker. It's practical, again, made in the USA. Our exit strategy. Entrepreneurs are really good at creating companies. We're lousy at maintaining them. Entrepreneurs also know that they use other people's money to start the company. That's how we work. Panera Bread and Starbucks pays one cent to, per pound to get rid of their stuff. Just the Starbucks that I would collect from, that would cost them $1,000 a year to get rid of their stuff. That's just one. That doesn't include your money. You got to take it, put into it. <clears throat> so the sor sources of fun. The four thousand bucks when I went today, I'll take the two kids in their truck. We'll go to Vegas. <laughs> I'll take the ten thousand dollars for ten percent equity, um, and then we'll buy six six drying facilities. Two thousand dollars instead of buying a truck. Again, I'll rent the boys, and. Uh, <laughs> And worst case scenario, the worst month, $6,000. Break even, 11,000 pounds. I have no problem with that. Farmers would take that up in a heartbeat. Why we deserve to win? We have a simple product. It's manufactured here. 68% of our 68 customers say we have a great product. We have a self-serving website. Cash, cash positive in five months. Net over 85,000 in the first year. The only competition we have are people that uh, they drink coffee. Well, we want those people because it's already a proven fact. They know what it does. They use it. We, want, we will target those people. Lastly, we're good for the environment. We're not going to spend 100,000 gallons of fuel to go to China and cut our nails. We're, we're going to take care of the environment here. And last of all, um, after I win this prize, come Monday morning and go to my boss with all due respect and tell him to take this job and put it with a sun don't shine. Just kidding. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Judges? Thank you. Um, I have a question about your drying facility. What kind of yield do you get from one of your units? Um, you can put, it's about 150 pounds. And over what time period? Um, it's in a day, pretty much. It dries pretty quick. Okay. And then what's the frequency? Let, let's say a farmer or a client purchased enough to do their entire area. Then what's the renewal? When would they do it again? A year? Most farmers that I've dealt with will put in the minimum 2,000 pounds to the acre. And then when I farmed, the max we did was 20,000 pounds to the acre. And it's twice a year. Two times a year? Okay. And what's your plan to reach the farmers? I might deal with them now. Paula, on this, uh, you'd be getting the coffee grounds from individual stores? Correct. Locally. And how much do average do they generate per day? Um, they average about 30 pounds. Uh, you threw me off a little bit talking about the tumbler. Is that going to be kind of cutting into your sales because you're allowing people to do it themselves at home? No, because those people that are going to do it at home, they're not going to drink enough coffee to cover the quarter acre. There's okay. about 5 million people that have a quarter acre lot. So, I mean, you'd have to drink a lot of coffee. I mean, 30 pounds worth of coffee is a lot. Yeah, that makes sense. And then you were saying that you were talking about maybe selling back after you know going through your process, selling it back to Starbucks? Correct. And how does that work? Well, because they, they spend one cent to get rid of it. So why not um, process it, take that uh, off their hands, process it, put it back on the shelves, and people that go in there for convenience to buy their coffee, see our stuff, say, hey, it's here. I need some more for my yard. Why not use it? Oh, so you're saying that Starbucks would be selling your, your garden grow, not reusing the coffee or anything? Correct. You can't okay. drink it. Okay. Ah. 
tastes terrible. All right, just wanted to make sure that you were selling people. Re okay, thank you. Cool, thank you. We had such a um, tight competition that we, this year we have an honorable mention. And what that means is you don't get any cash prize, but you get honorable mention, so you get recognized as not only being a finalist, but having honorable mention, and you also may attend the banquet with a guest and pitch, so you have that opportunity. Um, and so I'm going to start with our honorable mention, and we didn't plan on it, so I have nothing to hand you, um, but the honorable mention um, company is Remedy Fitness, Lynn Hartel. I hope you bring your husband to the banquet. <laughs> Our third place winner at Scheinfeld Center's third annual New Venture Challenge is, let me just double check that, Vintage Parlor and <laughs> Our second place winner is Craig Fetch. place winner and then I'll tell you a little story. The first place winner of the third annual New Venture Challenge at the Scheinfeld Center is Fertile Grounds. And this, this, Paolo. And I think all of the team that worked on it because this was an unprecedented joint effort between Santa Barbara City College and Allen Hancock College. So I think that we deserve to recognize the whole entire team. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, judges. Um, and so we're going to now shift to, um, well, I, I want to give the um, three judges just a, we have a couple of minutes to give a little feedback if you're comfortable, um, because I think that really has a high value point for the other um, presenters here, because I think we had just an unprecedented competition. And so if you'd like to um, take a couple of minutes to make some comments, um, we would really appreciate it. Well, first of all, I was really impressed with the presentations. They were great. But one thing that seemed not unanimous but common is I think people need to think bigger and really think beyond, you know, so like for Craig Fetch, it would have been great to hear more about a roll-out plan, roll plan to other cities or, and I'm not just picking them out, but of the other ones as well. Kind of think big beyond just Santa Barbara, what we're going to do next. It's, uh, it's really challenging. It's gotten tougher this year than it was certainly last year. Um, everybody does work really, really hard. We want to honor that because we know how much time and preparation it takes for you to get up here, how difficult that is. And when you believe in your product, it really comes through. I'll just say that because um, it's, it's, yeah, the financials have to work, but it also is how connected you are to your product and how much you believe in that, and that really comes through. So. Um, we want to thank everybody for, for having the courage to get up here and take a try at it. Yeah, I mean, I thought that, you know, first of all, I'm happy I didn't have to present this year. Uh, I think that there was a number of people who deserve to get some money and keep working with their business. And I just want to say to, you know, everyone that didn't win or even if you didn't get the place that you wanted, it doesn't mean that you can't stop doing what you're doing. And um, the bottom line is, is your business will go as far as you'll take it. And... <coughs> the amount of time and effort that you're willing to put into it. So I just encourage everyone to not give up on their dream and to just keep working at it because 
everyone who presented today has an opportunity to make that business happen. Excellent. Thank you so much. And a hand, a hand, yeah. Why don't you make a comment and then we'll... Yeah, I'd like to. Hi everyone, my name is Bonnie Chavis. I am the uh, chair of the Business Administration Department and I have the unique honor of uh, overseeing our entrepreneurship program. There's just two people I want to thank. There's a bunch of people, actually three, but <clears throat> I'm a little emotional. This would never ever happen or have happened without this wonderful lady. <laughs> I also want to uh, thank our dean, who is our strongest advocate and supporter in everything that we do. And I also want to thank, and most of you will never see or know him because he's not that kind of man. I'd like to thank Dr. John Anton. Stand up, John. Uh, this, this man spends hours and hours and hours coaching, mentoring, encouraging, inspiring all of these young people that you saw here today. And without his support and dedication, they wouldn't be on the stage either. So thank you, John. Thank you. Well, I want to thank our panel of judges once again that your effort is impressive. Thank you so much. And uh, a little note to one of my favorite products, um, Matt. I've got a buyer for, for you over here, with Diane Hollum. So if you want to start selling, you better talk to her before you leave. Thank you, everyone. And we will shift now to the high school competition. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Uh, my name's Kevin, and I um, am looking to create Computer City. Uh, can you imagine a store where you could walk in and all your technology problems are solved, whether it be your smartphone, your PC, or your tablet? You can even purchase that upgrade you've always wanted, and we can install it for you free of charge. A nice, comfortable place where you can pay bills, go on social media networks, or play a game or two with people who enjoy the same interests as you. Uh, I want to invite you to join in Computer City and make it all possible. Uh, our mission at Computer City is to help the customer get more in tune with computers and technology in a comfortable setting that provides knowledgeable customer service. My legal structure will be a limited liability partnership, and it will consist of me as a general partner and my investor or partner as a limited partner. My advisory board will be Mr. Dean. Uh, he currently owns his own computer store and is my entrepreneurship advisor. Mrs. Copeland is a A-plus certified computer technician with an accountant uh, time behind that. Mr. Magical, my uncle, uh, currently owns a internet cafe known as uh, Ephonet, and it is running strong, and my uh, company is modeled after that. Uh, the, uh, there's a giant opportunity in this store uh, because there's a need for technology tutoring and for social media, and there's an increasing rate of uh, personal computer gaming at a 19.1% each year for a $68 billion company. Uh, uh, I'll be opening my company in Los Angeles where there's 18 million people. And out of those 18 million people, 69.1% are from the ages 14 to 50. I surveyed around 50 people in the Los Angeles area and 38 would be interested to join in the store, and five said maybe, and seven had no interests. To be conser conservative, I counted the yes votes and not the maybe. Uh, uh, Computer City will have the same prices as the other stores in, on the screen. Uh, uh, with the bonus of computer repairs and tutoring, in addition to cyber time and computer repair, Computer City will also offer copies, snacks, and computer accessories. My promotion will be through flyers, social media, which includes YouTube. Uh, 
Determining my economics of one unit was difficult because I have three different revenue sources. I project 45% of my income will come from cyber time, 33% will come from repairs, and 22% from other sales. I predict the average customer to spend $20 per visit with the cost of goods sold at $5.05, which gives me a total contribution margin of $14.95 per customer. My annual, oh sorry, my annual fixed expenses average, which includes those on the screen, uh, the salaries of my employees will consist of the 15 hours a day the store is open. The wages of the computer repair technicians are included in the cost of goods. Utilities are high due to the electrical usage. The depreciation is through a whole three years. Uh, I plan to rent a 1,500 square foot building with $200 uh, per square foot for a total of just over $150,000. I predict the average customer to spend, sorry, I predict the average customer to spend $20 per visit with uh, 27,375 customers in the first year, which is about five customers per hour, which brings my total sales to 547,500 at a, with the variable expenses at uh, 138,240 and fixed ex operating expenses. My pre-tax profit is just under $26,000, or $260,000, I'm sorry, and a net profit of $220,000 for the first year. I will need to purchase computers related equipment, accessories, and computers, office supplies, chairs, games, and total of $43,000. I bought, I budgeted cash res, uh, reserve for video games and future equipment for a total startup investment of $121,500. And, uh, now, how will I finance this, you say? Um, first, I will spend $21,500 of my own money with a $13,000 from my own mother, my generous mother. And, my, and I am seeking partners for an additional $87,000. And my return on sales will be 40.2%. Uh, and my return on investments will be a healthy 181.3%. And my break-even units is about 10,037 units, which averages about two customers per hour. And computers have never been so simple. Uh, and I invite you to partner with me in Computer City, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Um, I had a question on one of your slides you went through real quick. You had these com the comparable uh, other organizations that were out there doing a similar kind of a thing. Was, yeah, what, what, yes, talk about that a little bit. How, how yes, have you done your sort of market research? Um, well, I actually surveyed over 10 different land centers in the Los Angeles area. And out of those 10, the e-game land center is the greatest and well-known there with, amongst those 10. And um, and Ephonet Cyber is which my uncle, Mr. Madrigal, owns, and he is helping me, guide me, and to make this business more prosperous. Great, thank you. Thank you. How much, how much room is going to be you going to take up with the computer repair part of the operation? You said you have fifteen hundred square feet. So how are you dividing that up? Uh, I'm going to be having a little section for computer repairs and where the customer could come in and participate and see what the computer technicians do. So I would say it would about 150 square feet. Okay, thank you. Right. Sorry. Um, the computer repair is something that may be variable, especially very little at the beginning and maybe certain times of the day. So have you considered um, instead of having someone full-time sitting there 
not necessarily being productive, um, having having part time people until you grow enough to support a full time. That is a great question, um, sir. Uh, we will be having one employee at a time working on the computers. Well, out of the fifteen hours, the eight uh, sorry, the eight hours, they will be uh, working for eight hours. Then when the one leaves, the other the other employee, which would be a certified computer technician in repair, will come in and repair with uh, repair and take the amount of hours from the other employee. Branding. You see it everywhere, from a Ralph Lauren designer sweater to a pair of Billabong flip-flops. The world is full of branding. But what is better than a brand? Customization. Through the option of putting custom graphics on clothing, the consumers are put in control. They free, they free themselves from conformity and dependency. As Seth Godin put it, microtrends matter more than macro ones, but most of all, people matter. Individual human beings with needs and wants and interests. Hello everyone, my name is Justa Razas. I'm the CEO of the Dawn's Night Cafe, a student-run business at Santa Barbara High School founded in 1993 that focuses its efforts on the community and the worldwide. But today, I am presenting Design & Cut, a new venture of the Dawn's Night Cafe. Design & Cut is, our, is, freeing, is gonna free the customer from the dependence of a brand. We market to the individual, a niche of one, using a vinyl cutting machine and a heat press we can put custom graphics onto a large variety of apparel. Our mission statement is to inspire students to create positive social and environmental changes through entrepreneurship, leadership, and service learning while maintaining the level of stability and success exhibited in previous years. And that is why, we are here, that's why I'm here today to ask for a $1,000 grant to increase our profit and your investment. This is a chart of functional responsibilities of each of the employees who were chosen based on their work experience and skills, each hired by business advisory members. Our specific, our specific business partners for this new venture include Steve Gummins from Athens Capital, Tyson Blades, and Will Freeland from Montecito Bank and Trust. Our primary target market are the students at Santa Barbara High School. They have an average age between 14 and 19 years and buy in patterns that follow current popular styles. They have a variable income depending on parental money and low income jobs. Our SWOT, an SWOT analysis. Our strengths lie in our track record of profitable ventures, diverse selection of employees, close contact with alumni, most who have moved on to business jobs and help us with expertise in the number of areas, as well as the student body, which is our main market. Our history of winning awards like the MTV's Agents of Change, Best Volunteer Tax Site by the IRS, and named uh, Best Civic Minded Group by Sandra Day O'Connor are strengths because they inspire us to live up to our expectations. Our weaknesses lie in school regulations and limited production time. As our brick and mortar location is out of school, we can only conduct business during school hours. Vinyl is also not one of the most earth friendly material and this could turn away potential customers. Opportunities. We have a huge amount of opportunities through events around town and clients and business partners and sponsors. Quickly changing trends are also opportunities as we can put almost any design on any, on any clothing types to customize. School activities are also big opportunities to advertise and promote our product. Threats. We have few threats that are imminent to our marketplace. One is the possibility of increasing school regulations, which could hinder our forward progress. But we feel that our customer base will continue to grow as it has for years. As you can see, we offer more, we offer more products than our competitors. Cost marketing leads us to the conclusion that we will have an advantage in even the areas that are offered by other companies. Not only do we offer more products, but people will buy our product over other companies because they know the money will either directly or indirectly benefit education. Our marketing campaign builds demand, and to effectively meet that demand, we have streamlined our order and delivery process to be as straightforward and simple as possible. First, the customer fills out an order sheet that can be found at our store or on our website, donsnetcafe.com. Then they create or pick a design. 
With the help of a graphic artist, we create that design on Adobe Illustrator. Through the use of a vinyl cutting machine, we cut up the design, we peel it, and we heat press it onto the shirt. Here's an example of a finished product. There is a one to 10 day turnaround time for each product. And to doing, in our mission to doing some good in the world, we have came up with this new reflective clothing that we use uh, to help make biking, bike riding a safer activity for the youth. This is our break-even analysis. As you can see, we'll break even after selling merely 14 items. This is due to a generous donation which paid for a vinyl cutting machine and a large amount of vinyl to start up. This model is based on the fact that the average item sold by Design and Cut is $20, and we make around $11 of profit, giving us a 55% profit margin. We have no standard fixed costs, as our brick and mortar location is at a school, and utilities and rent are covered but we do have insurance on our vinyl cutting machine, as you can see by our $100 fixed costs. This is our balance sheet from March 31st, since the start of the company, and we have made almost $1,500. This is possible because, like we previous, like previously stated, we have no fixed costs and no startup costs due to the donation. This is our income statement. The bottom line of this is we are making money. The Donsec have faced new expansion into the clothing industry is extremely promising. Our high school market will buy our products because not only are they affordable and convenient, but because they feel the sense of loyalty to their classmates and school. We can buy, we can meet the needs of this captive market because we are part of the student body and we know what they want. Our other target markets will buy from us because they know that an investment in the Donsec Cafe is an investment in education and the community. We are in a strong financial position to open this new venture as we have positive cash flow from previous operations, a history of successful ventures, and have remained profitable even through tough economic times. We mean business and we want your business. Invest with the Donsac Cafe, buy from the Donsac Cafe, and join the Donsac Cafe so you can do some good in the world and keep this venture expanding. Thank you. Judges, do you have questions? For the $1,000, what would you use it for? We would buy a new uh, heat presser that would increase our profits because we will be able to make more t-shirts uh, uh, in limited time. Are you planning to license uh, trademark logos and names or just deal with things that are not under trademark? Uh, yeah, we, on our um, order sheet, there's a signature so we can use their, des uh, their designs, but we will trademark um, if, it's our pro if it's our products. Right, I mean uh, from other companies that are already trademarked. Oh, we will ask for permission before uh, we can use them. If not, um, we've, well, we probably won't be able to use them since it's their logos. Okay. Um, could you go back to your chart? You did a little comparative analysis um, between you and the other uh, group, which I seemed like one of your, yeah, right there. So your real competitors, it seems like your real uh, strategic advantage is the location, right? Because you're, you guys are going to be selling these things on campus. Uh -huh. Tell us a little bit about how that's going to work. Well, that's a big advantage because we don't have to pay the rent and that um, we make more money because of that, regardless to them who have to pay rent and water, like bills and that. So that gives us a, a huge advantage in making money. Thank you. Hi, my name is William Vermant, and I'm from Dos Pueblos High School, and I have the company Secure. So let me ask you this. What do you do when you lose your smartphone? You probably get anxious and try to pull out your hair, right? Well, there's some solutions out there right now, including Zom, Phone Halo, and Find My iPhone app. These are some choices that you have to find your to find your phone whenever you lose it. But there's another problem. What happens if you lose your phone and it's off? What are you gonna do then? That's where my product comes into play. Smartphone case with a GPS chip installed. So whenever you lose your phone and it's out of battery or not even out of battery, you'll be able to find it no matter what. The key is you simply have to log on to our website or our mobile app 
you call in if you don't have a website or, or you don't have the internet with you. You just call on and you, you can hear your phone ringing or you hear the GPS chip ringing wherever it is, whether it's under the sofa or in your car or maybe even left it at a restaurant. You'll be, able, you'll be able to see on a map or you'll be able to hear it, which makes it completely convenient and separates it from the other competitors that are out there right now because you're able to hear it when it's off. Right now, the cell phone industry is growing and the, the market for cell phone accessories is projected to grow to 80, 84.6 billion excuse me, by 2018 with cell phone cases taking up a, small, or a large portion of that market. The cell phone industry or the cell phone case industry makes up about or grew 69% over the last year and is expected to keep growing of a large amount each year to come, which is why this is the right time for me to enter this market. Also, when people are looking to buy their phone cases, they're looking for durability and protection. Those are the two things that my cases will guarantee make your life easier. With the protection, you know that your cell phone is safe at all times. You don't have to worry about losing it, losing all those precious contacts, losing all those images that you've built up over years. And our case as well is completely durable and in future years will expand to waterproof cases and cases for um, Androids and smartphones since we'll begin with iPhones as they seem to be the most popular at this point. So our business model. We'll start with R&D. We have to build a prototype. That's the initial step. After we build the prototype, we'll go into manufacturing which is a huge step in getting our product out on the market. And after we get to marketing and sales, we'll choose to do those two through our online website, which I predict to give us about 60% of our sales total. And we'll also look to wholesale our product to larger brands, such as Target, Best Buy, and we'll also go to um, service providers such as AT&T and Verizon to carry our product so that everybody can have our case since this will be the case that they want. As far as um, marketing goes, we'll start with Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram to get our product into the, into the eyes of everybody so they recognize our product. Um, we'll also go into emails, mobile marketing apps, as well as brochures and flyers to give promotional incentives for our product. So if you buy one, we can give you 10% off if you buy another, um, stuff sort of like that. And we will also, I will personally go to corporate centers for Best Buy and Target, like I mentioned before, to get, our, to get my product into each of those stores uh, all across the United States. For financials, the first three years are built completely on starting this business, getting the prototype finished, getting the manufacturing set, having a complete product that we're ready to start taking to the next level. By the fourth year, we're expecting sales and a gross revenue of around 400,000. By the end of the seventh year, we're looking at a total sales of 16 million with a gross revenue of 6.5 million. This comes from me selling phones at a price of, phone cases, sorry, at a price of $40, uh, costing 30, 26, $23 for each case. That includes the cost of manufacturing, the cost of, the, of each material that we use, as well as the per unit cost for uh, labor and, re and rent as well. Uh, we will also be adding other products including wallets and keychains to help people ensure that they won't lose those products as well since those have huge implicit costs as well and value in them. So you might be asking yourself, why is this the best company? And I know I can take this company to the next level. I will take this company from here to here because of my competitive entrepreneurial spirit that I've gained throughout my life by mentors such as Melissa from my city college class that I'm taking here, 
as well as from teachers at Dos Pueblos High School and family members that are entrepreneurs as well. I am prepared to go to Babson College next year, which is the number one entrepreneurial school in the nation. And I'm very excited to uh, refine my knowledge, knowledge that I've gained over these many of these 18 years that I've been alive. And I'm completely dedicated to everything I do. I will take this, pro this product to the next level until it succeeds. I will make sure that this product makes it. As for the investment, I'm looking for 400,000 for 35% due to the high cost of prototype and, and beginning of manufacturing. Um, that is where this money will go to. I expect it to pay off within the seven years that I mentioned, if not earlier, because of this great product that has inspired me to take my entrepreneurial beliefs to the next level. Thank you. Judges, do you have questions? Um, yeah, one question on the, um, the application of the um, case to the mm -hmm. cell phone. Is the um, chip that you need to fit in there, to, how, have you kind of figured out how that's gonna work d dimension mm -hmm. wise and thickness wise and all of that? Yeah, the chip is not very, is not very thick. You, there's a cover on top of the, of the case. So we have a case and we've, it's a little bit larger, but it adds extra protection which is what 86% of people say is the most important part in buying a cell phone case. Um, how are you actually gonna communicate to the uh, GPS chip? Is it gonna be, have a cellular connection? Yes, it's through, it's through our server. That'll be recognized globally. Well, what I mean is you have this chip sitting somewhere mm -hmm. in a phone case and how will you be communicating with the chip when it's 20 miles or 1,000 miles away? Right, right. It's through, our, um, it's through the GPS and through our uh, phone system that we'll have connected into it. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So how long do you think between, it's going to take you to prototype and you know, before you can get to the first release of your product? I think I can get a prototype done by the end of this year and I can begin manufacturing and have a larger scale at the end of 2014. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Isaac Romero. I'm in the 11th grade and I'm 16 years old. I believe that technology is advancing towards handheld portable devices such as iPhones and iPods and moving away from computers and laptops. That is why I created I Got It Repairs. I Got It Repairs is a company that repairs and replaces iPods or iPhones and iPod screens at a minimal cost. I Got It Repairs broken iPhones and iPods. Statistics show that 25% of iPhones have broken or cracked screens, and that's just iPhones alone. We replace your old parts with new high quality replacements and we have multiple colors and choices for our screens. I got it as a service business as well as a retail business. This is because we'll be uh, servicing iPhones and replacing their parts and selling uh, accessories such as the secure case that could be a possibility. Uh, re we repair iPhones and iPods with cracked screens, bad batteries, and faulty buttons for the general public. We also sell accessories and do-it-yourself kits which include the tools and the screens uh, necessary to repair your phone. I got it as a sole proprietorship, and that is because I want to take uh, rep responsibility for my business myself. I'm qualified for three main reasons. The first being that I've repaired uh, iPhones and iPods since May of, or March of 2012. In that time, I've repaired 70 phones, and there's a picture of a couple of screens um, that I've repaired in the past couple months. I am also currently taking an entrepreneurship class, and last night I was actually elected treasurer of my FFA. Um, chapter which also qualifies me to run my business. My market analysis is um, based around the iPhone repair industry which generates over $5 million per year. I'm going to be targeting San Andreas Valley uh, adults, both male and female, ages 16 through 40 with an income of $35,000 or greater, which equals $5,870. The potential market size for that is 
50% because I surveyed uh, 50 people and half of them were willing to purchase the service I offered. I got it is a unique business, but it's not the only one of its style. There's Celtech and iDoctor SB, both in Santa Barbara. Although we have similar prices at the beginning, uh, when you get into the more diverse and difficult uh, repairs and replacements, there's a higher price for those, although we all have the excellent service and great service. My location is uh, going to set me apart from them because they're both in Santa Barbara and I'm in San Inez Valley, which does not have any technolog technological repair services in the valley. Uh, unique factors uh, is that I will have a shared storefront, which means that I would have a, a portion of the store that's already established, and I'll al also be mobile. And Celtech has two storefronts, both in Santa Barbara, and iDoctorSB is only mobile. My cost of materials and labor is $22 for a black and white screen, uh, $29 for the basic colors, which are rainbow colors. Uh, mirror colors are $30 each, which are basically the color with the, it's a mirror on top of it, so you can see um, yourself in the reflection when it's off. And replacement batteries are $5 each for a total material cost per unit of $25.75. I'll be paying myself $30 per hour, which it takes me half an hour to repair one phone. So the labor per unit is $15 for a total cost of service sold of $40.75. The economics of one unit is based around a repair and accessory sold to a single customer. Uh, the selling price is uh, $87.50 at a cost of service sold per unit is $40.75. Other variable expenses are $1.25, which would include shipping or any other um, things that have to pay for mail-in orders or do-it-yourself kits. The total variable expense per unit is $42 for a contribution margin of $40 or $45.50. The average monthly fixed expenses include insurance at $100, and because the cost for me to repair the phones is already uh, in the cost of service sold, I would not be paying anyone beside myself that money that I already paid myself. The advertising includes Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, which is all free, uh, flyers and business cards, which will be distributed throughout the valley. Um, and I also actually created an app which shows all my repairs and all the prices for them that is available on the iTunes store. I will not have any interest or depreciation, but I will have utilities such as telephone and internet which would be bundled. And the rent, which would be a space within an existing business, is $450 because the average cost per square foot in the same as Valley is a dollar, and I'd be looking for around 400 to 450 square feet. My total monthly fixed expenses would be $650. The projected yearly income statement would be $87.50 per uh, unit sold, and I'd have around 44 units sold for a, a month for $520 at the end of the year, with a total sales of $45,500 and variable expense of $21,840. After you take out the contribution, or after you take that out, you have the contribution margin of 23660 with fixed operating expenses at the end of the year equaling 7800 And your pre-tax profit is 15860 Taxes are 15% because I'm not making more than $50,000, and those would be $2,379. At a total net profit at the end of the year for 13481 My startup expenditures would uh, include a black, and black or white screen, for $22, a color screen for $29, a mirror screen for $30, iPhone 5 black and white screen for $150, and iPhone 5 color housing for $59. And I'll be getting all these from Trumax Electronics Company, um, which I've already contacted and have established them as my uh, supplier. And my cash reserves would include an emergency fund for $500 and reserve fixed expense or four fixed expenses of $650 in case I get injured and I cannot operate my business. Um, the total startup investment would be $1,440. My personal savings would be $800, and my uh, relatives and friends would contribute by helping or by giving me $640, which $340 I would be paying back, and $300 would be a gift. Uh, that would equal my goal of $1,440. And I'd like to remind you all that when you crack or you break your phone in any way, don't worry because I got it.
Judges, do you have questions? Yeah, you uh, compared uh, storefronts uh, in Santa Barbara as a competitor, but how do you compare with um, online sources for fixing phones? Well, they're, the only online sources on, um, are actual storefronts as well, because I've gone on and I've looked at eye repair, eye correct, and all that, and there's even uh, some storefronts that post on Instagram, and I'm friends with all of them, we communicate, and so I don't think that online would be a big deal, it'd just be helping uh, the storefront itself. My, my question was more, how do your uh, costs compare with the cost of online services from other areas? Oh, uh, my costs are actually lower than other storefronts and online services, such as Apple or Celtech, which cost upwards of $200, and Celtech is uh, 135 which my cost, my highest cost is $110. Thank you. Um, have you thought about sort of the, the strategic advantage of being up there in the valley? It sounds like you'd be the only person in yes. that marketplace. Talk about that a little bit. How well, because I'm in the valley, there's uh, not really anyone who can repair those there. And because Santa Barbara is so far from the valley, the cost of gas and my price is cheaper than the Santa Barbara locations would be saving money in both ways. And because we have a big tourist, uh, Come, big amounts of tourists coming in, there would also be that uh, advantage. When, have you looked at these, how, the number of cell phones in the area and then the percentage that are cracked just to see what that No, I would be? looked at the overall number of cell phones and the overall number of cracked cell phones, mm -hmm. which is 25% are cracked and um, 11 choose to keep it that way and 14% choose to uh, get it fixed. I thought one of your slides said it takes you about a half hour to do the repair. Yes. So if you have 44 units. That's okay. Finish the question. And 44 can units answer. per um, month. You know, that gives you 22 hours of work. And so what are you going to do with the other couple hundred hours that most entrepreneurs put in? Well, with those, I'd be using to run the storefront where I'd be selling accessories or doing the the filling out the sheets so I can get my parts in, and also I would be taking some time off from my storefront and actually using that towards uh, the local students at, um, in the valley to help them do their homework and tutor them. Thank you. Great job, thank you. Those are our presenters. I just wanted to comment that our um, high school presenters are amazing um, and such high quality. Um, I, it's just incredible the um, command they have over business numbers. Pretty incredible. The winners are invited to attend the banquet next week where they'll receive their cash prizes and be able to pitch for 60 seconds. And we have the third place winner Winning $400 is Computer City. First place winner is Design and Cut. Oh. And um, I, I want William to come up here too, because I have to say, William is um, a college student in my Entrepreneurship 208 class, Business Plan Development, and he did two um, business plans, <laughs> one for the college program, one for the high school program, and his collegiate work, he really, he deserves some recognition because his collegiate work, even though he's a high school student, um, stood out um, as amazing compared to my other college students, and then he came to pitch for the high school, so thank you, William. I really appreciate all the work you've done. And so, um, judges, do you want to make a few comments? Yeah, if we had a, if we had an honorable mention, I, I thought 
William, you did an awesome job. Everybody did a great job. You guys got to feel really good about yourself just to get up here and pitch these ideas. And it's very difficult to judge all of these different things. So what we were trying to look for, what's something that's up and running that you can really make happen right away? And um, I love your presentation, William, so you did an awesome job there. You got to feel good about that. And look at the two extremes. It's a t-shirt, you know, printing business to an $18 million, you know, another idea here. So I think all of you guys really deserve an award for being here. Um, what we were really wrestling with, and there's a lot of discussion back and forth, but um, the fact that you guys have developed a business plan that's up and running, you've got the technology, you've got the team to make it happen, and it's a viable, you know, realistic business, and you've got strategic positions. That's one of the things that, like, you can, you can really make this happen, and you're already doing it. So it's very, it's very viable, and I think that's really the thing that pushed one, things one way or another. And I don't want you to feel like, William, that you didn't, you know, you, like, had a great, awesome presentation it's just you're jumping into a technology that's so far out there you don't know if it's going to work or not where these guys are up and running so you know get on their team and you'll you'll make them just soar to the top you know so yeah. good good job i think what we saw consistently um is that the judges agreed very easily which means that you know y'all made your points very clear um it was very close but again it was very clear um what y'all were doing and stuff like that so i, I getting an idea across is tough, okay? And y'all did an excellent job with that, and you should be very proud of yourself for that. Uh, this is just another way of, of sort of discussing what we already said, but, but basically, we looked at a competition with high school kids um, of what they might be able to go out tomorrow and do. In fact, some of you already started doing it. And so the, the three winners all looked viable to do something tomorrow. Uh, William, what you proposed has huge potential, and so I'm going to suggest that you go forward with something like that for the uh, college competition, and um, you know you might get a, a little bit uh, better response because it's not it's not something that has to be done tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, um, I have some special certificates to acknowledge our judges. Gary, John, and Michael, thank you again for you know, coming every year and um, participating in our high school competition. We really appreciate it.